Okay, so Len, you're all set to go, and why don't you go ahead, uh, take it away. Everybody should mute their mic, by the way. And uh, if you uh, uh, you want to speak, I think uh, Len, we're all pretty informal here. Just I think you're you're free to go ahead and interrupt. Uh, uh, yes, and if I think there's some need to do it by uh, net control sort of process, I'll serve that role. Okay, go ahead, Len. Yep. Yeah, I, I definitely take uh, questions as we go. So uh, there's nothing like a question that, that's uh, being asked and answered in context instead of later. So that's absolutely great. All right, so you're seeing my screen okay at this point, Mike? Yes, we are seeing the Teensy Maestro screen here. All right, so I'm Len, KD0RC. Uh, gonna talk about this little box that I built. And what this thing is, is a little homebrew gizmo that gives us knobs, buttons, a touch display, a CW memory keyer, all for Flex 6000 series it's, uh, software defined radios. It operates in conjunction with, not instead of smart SDR software, <clears throat> which is the software that is normally used to control the uh, Flex 6000 radios. It uses a TC 4.1 board, which is an Arduino workalike is what I call it, uh, using the TNC Duino add-in to the Arduino IDE, which is the integrated development environment. So if you have uh, Arduinos and are familiar with that, the TNC is just like an Arduino, except about a thousand times more powerful. I programmed this thing in Arduino flavored C++ using the Flex API library that uh, IW7DMH created. So the Flex API is the application programming interface, and that gives you access to everything in the Flex radio. And I mean everything in the Flex radio. There, there's nothing left out. And then what Enzo IW7DMH did was he took that, put a shell around it that somebody like me who's not into the intricacies of C++ can actually use. It connects to the radio using TCP IP over ethernet using that API. It is not cat commands. So if you're familiar with Ken Wood and ICOM, Yezu, everybody has cat commands, Flex does too, but cat commands are very limited in what they can do and how much of the radio you can access through them. So this is doing something that really is full on radio as opposed to a little, interesting subset like CAT provides. And then with my Teensy Maestro, I can also connect remotely using soft ether over a VPN, uh, I mean, uh, using the soft v ether VPN. Uh, it's, I would have preferred to do it using smart link, but I haven't figured that out yet. Uh, once I do, I won't have to use my VPN anymore. And this is what it looks like. That's a, that's a Flex 6400. Um, no knobs. It has one user control, and that's the power button, and uh, that's it. There's, of course, it has all the connections on the back, but one user interface control on the entire radio. So that takes a little getting used to. So normally you have something called Smart SDR, and this is Smart SDR running on a laptop. That's what you saw earlier on my screen and you have complete mouse and keyboard control <clears throat> of the radio. Absolutely everything can be controlled from here. It's a really great interface. Uh, the other way that you can control a flex radio is through their Maestro. And this gives you that same uh, kind of display, but knobs and buttons instead of mouse and keyboard. And in my opinion, oops, that's mostly great. To make it really great, I wanted mouse and keyboard operation combined with physical controls. And now since I have built this, Flex has come out with something called smart control that actually lets you use the knobs and buttons of the Maestro along with smart SDR. So you now get the best of both worlds in the Maestro as well. But uh, we'll just concentrate on what I built. So let's look a little bit about what, uh, what's in this thing. So everything on this half of the screen is everything that operates slice A. Now they call the receivers slices because they're a slice of a spectrum. And you can also think of it VFO, 
I put the, the labels on here, VFO A and B, because I'm old, uh, and that's how I think of it. It's not really a VFO, but it does tune the slice as if it were a VFO. So you have on this side, the A receiver, on this side, the B receiver. And then in the middle here, I have some menu control and CW speed. Uh, I no longer have mic gain here. I have moved that, but that's another story. So the things that you can do, volume, uh, something called AGC threshold, hugely important and much misunderstood control of the flex radio. This is so important. This, this gives you the ability to not amplify noise while you are amplifying signals. It's, it's phenomenal. Most people that complain about a noisy flex radio simply have not adjusted this correctly. The other things that I have on here that are really important to me are the low, uh, low, sh low uh, cut, high cut, and uh, which is shift and width when you're in CW. So depending on mode, these two knobs change their, their uh, flavor. And then of course the VFO or tuning knob here, you can set the RIT and XIT on and off and step size, which is here, uh, up or down. And you can also mute, uh, select or set the RIT, the XIT, select the noise blank or the noise reduction and uh, turn them on and off over here. And then the CW speed is here. <clears throat> and what you see on the screen for each receiver is which receiver. In this case, I have the B slice is active and that's why it's highlighted and then A slice is not highlighted. Uh, that doesn't really matter to the Teensy Maestro because I have control uh, through separate knobs of each side. But when you're mouse, you don't have two mice uh, running it. So when you're in Smart SDR, which, uh, which slice is active is important to you because that's the one that the mouse will drive. And I can set the step size, uh, whether or not it's mute or locked what the noise blank or noise reduction are set to, the volume, the AGC threshold, the RIT, uh, because RIT and XIT are dim here, that means that they're not active. Uh, if they were active, they'd be bright, and I, I can change their uh, settings. I have an S meter on here that follows the radio, and filter settings. And everything below this little line here is are items that are not slice specific. So my uh, here words per minute, uh, the extra class license that I've coded into this, uh, that's uh, user, user changeable. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, what my RF power is, my CW message source. So these six buttons are CW message buttons. So there's one through six, or if I long press these buttons, and the, what determines a long press versus a short press is user settable. A long press will then do the corresponding messages that are stored within the flex. So you can use either or both sets. And then uh, finally, the CW paddles, whether they're right or left-handed. And then I have three modes keyed in here, uh, coded in. One is iambic A, iambic B, and the third one is something called automatic. And that's in there for a very specific reason. I wanted to see if I could do it. <laughs> I, I have never really used it. Uh, it's somewhat similar to my uh, vacuum tube keyer that I built back in 196, out of the 1967 handbook that I built in 1968. Um, and I, I have graduated to iambic king and I, and I don't think I'll go back. So any, any questions on this? That's, that's kind of a layout of it at this point. All right, so building this thing, I bought this Flex in February of last year. I found an interesting Arduino project for Flex radios by Enzo, IW7DMH, a brilliant Italian uh, C++ programmer, absolutely brilliant. And in May, I, on a whim, ordered the parts, and then discovered some of them had gone unobtainium. Boom. The real problem was I didn't have the same uh, display. And as a result, 
I, I couldn't make his code work because I don't have access to his code. I have access to his library, but not the code that runs the, the um, control box. So I fooled around with some C++ and used his library. And I actually got my Arduino to connect to the Flex. Well, that was fun. So then I added a couple controls and I actually got a working set of knobs and buttons. And so I put them into a prototype box I made out of cardboard. So this is like a, a, a DigiKey or a mouser box or something. <clears throat> and this is, I don't know, maybe the fourth incarnation of this as I moved controls around trying to find something that would work. So as a hint and kink, if you're, if you're uh, home brewing something, a cardboard box is a fantastic way to test out different ways that you might want to set up your, your controls. So this is getting close to the end of what I did. Uh, it was pretty much operational, but I only have a couple of buttons. I think I had four buttons at this point and none of these LEDs. So you see at this point, before I decided on that display, uh, all these little circles represent LEDs to enunciate the various uh, things that I was doing. And there's a ton of LEDs on here, bunches of them. And then a whole bunch more buttons, uh, independent of the buttons that are on these switches, on the uh, encoders. So I had a ton of buttons, tons and tons of LEDs uh, that I just hadn't gotten to at this point. But I was starting to have so much fun using this thing. It was, it was turning into a, a truly useful uh, piece of gear for me. And so I kind of quit working on it. I just, it was more fun to operate the thing than it was to build it at some point. So it also hinted at a few poor design decisions that I made. Uh, first thing I did was run out of IO pins on the Arduino. Uh, the buttons, the encoders, the ethernet shield took up a bunch. That takes up over half of the, uh, of the, of the real estate that you have on the uh, Arduino. And then that vast array of planned LED indicators and all the buttons I hadn't put in yet, um, I was long past the ability to do anything. I also generated pretty much an impossible to solder matrix for the buttons. So I did a five by five matrix. So five rows plus five columns gives, it means 10 pins and the intersection of every row and column when they're shorted together by a button gives you 25 intersections or 25 buttons. And I coded up a few, I mean, I soldered in a few of them, I think four. It was pretty easy and I said, great, this, this'll work. So I moved on to other things. Uh, but as it turned out, the resultant nest of wiring was just ridiculous. And I couldn't seem to get the fifth button in there without messing up the other four. So I finally unsoldered enough to get it to work again, realized I just didn't have enough real estate allocated on that little board that I built to do this. Plus I interleaved the rows and columns thinking that would be the easy way to go. That was absolutely the worst decision on the planet. So that little interface board that I built was a disaster. I used temp inch header pins instead of soldering onto the proto board that I used. That proto board, which I'll show you in a couple slides here, uh, was a really good decision. That worked out great. The header pins, not so much. Now I still have them in there. Uh, I've taken this out a lot of times. None of them have shaken loose, but anytime I open the back, I always kick a couple loose and then it's another hour to figure out what pin came off and where did it go. So uh, at some point I may solder those. And so by all this, if you haven't guessed yet, uh, yeah, I'm not an engineer. But the Flex, Flex Community Forum really came to my rescue. Uh, the Flex Radio hosts a user forum that is just outstanding. Um, Dan, you, you and your crew on this thing have been uh, unbelievably helpful to me. This, this has been the best resource of any resource that I've used is that forum. And that goes for operating the radio, having problems with the radio, uh, general radio problems and specific problems like I was having trying to make the API work. 
So then a guy, John, G3WGV on the forum, answered a couple of my questions that I had, and he got me past a couple of the real simple things that I was just doing insane things. I'm not a C++ programmer. I'm old. I know things like Fortran and PL1 and COBOL, not C++. So uh, I, he got me past a couple of those just really basic things that I was doing wrong and steered me towards the use of multiplexers for the buttons. Because when I mentioned that I was having that problem, he said, oh, why don't you use a multiplexer? Not, a, not an engineer didn't dawn on me. So uh, he helped me out there. Once I got those multiplexers figured out, I suddenly had the ability to address 32 buttons using only seven IO pins instead of 25 buttons for the cost of 10 pins. And at the moment I'm only using 20, so I still have 12 buttons I can, I can invent some use for and put on this thing if I want to. So guys like Mike, Tim, Eric, and Dan to mention it, from Flex Radio have jumped in on several of my questions and got me squared away very quickly. And this is when you learn that reading the documentation and actually understanding the documentation are two different events. So, <laughs> but uh, those guys help me out. Uh, it, it's just a great forum. So if you ever get a Flex Radio or if you have a Flex Radio, uh, that's the place to be. All right, so then I got into a little bit of scope creep. Since I'm my own boss on this thing, that was no problem. Uh, a company called PJRC that makes the Teensy 4 board, they came out with the Teensy 4.1 that has the built-in Ethernet. And I couldn't believe it. It's like, wow, that's just what I need. Gave me back a bunch of uh, I.O. pins on the thing. So I pulled apart my Arduino Due mess. I rebuilt it using the Teensy 4.1 and virtually all the code ported across with no changes. I had to make some changes like what pin things were assigned to, but those were just uh, constants. I mean, it was a quick, quick change and I had to change one library reference and that was it. So then I took a color TFT touchscreen off a start and forget project that I was working on. And I got immediate relief from wiring and coding tons of buttons, tons of LED indicators, and not to mention, I didn't have to drill all those mounting holes. So this is what the thing looked like uh, when it was an Arduino Dewey. Sure seemed like a good idea at the time, but uh, not so much. So here's the boards. This bottom board is the Arduino Dewey. This board on top is the Ethernet shield that plugs right into it. And you can see it takes three quarters of the real estate of the Arduino just to plug in the ethernet. And then this little board in the back is my matrix nightmare. And you can see I have one, two, three, four of these uh, encoders that have uh, switches on them. I, I only have four of the switches in and I'm already practically out of real estate on this board. And I had, because of the way the DUA works, I wound up having to put pull up resistors. So I lost more real estate. It was just a nightmare it got exponentially more difficult to wire in each switch. So I fortunately stopped and rethought that. And this is what I came up with. So what you're looking at here, this is the Teensy board. Uh, this is the one of the two multiplexers that I have. This is the touchscreen controller. This is the ethernet connection, which just takes up four pins on the back of the Teensy board and none of the IO pins. So, and, plugging in the um, spy connected um, dis touch display just took a few pins and, and was no, no problem. SPI stands for um, Serial Peripheral Interface. So it's just a, a, a few lines here. Most of these lines that you see going somewhere um, are driving the clock and power and everything else. And then only a couple lines that actually drive the data. Uh, that, that does this. And then some of them, of course, are going over here to the touchscreen controller. Now, this TC uh, is a 600 megahertz ARM Cortex M7, as opposed to the DUA, which is an 84 megahertz M3. So, the orders of magnitude uh, more powerful than, than the Arduino and significantly cheaper. The, the uh, Teensy board was cheaper than either 
the Arduino Due or the Ethernet shield that it plugged into. By the time you plug both those things together, this thing is a real bargain. It was $32 or something for the board and the Ethernet connections. So if you're ever thinking about Arduino stuff, I would recommend looking at uh, PJRC and thinking about their little boards. They're, they're phenomenal. All right, so how did I build this thing? Well, I used a something called a Permaproto board from Adafruit. Uh, it's really designed to make, make it very easy to unplug your project from a prototyping board and solder it in in exactly the same way that you had it. So it makes it very easy to duplicate projects. So club projects, things like that are great for this. That's not so much why I had it. I didn't build mine in a, on a proto board as you saw in the previous slide, uh, but it just happens to give me two power rails. And on the back, you can see all the pins are connected just the way I would want them. And uh, it worked out great. And a couple of mounting holes, and this turned out to be a very easy way to mount it. So this, this was a great decision uh, to, to do something like this. And then for the front panel, uh, the way I got the front panel to look nice was I just laser printed this image on my printer at home and uh, sandwiched this paper in between uh, the aluminum front panel and a, a piece of ABS plastic that I bought at Ace Hardware. And then I just cut this out with a very sharp uh, X-Acto knife. And uh, any, any imperfections you know, on the aluminum cut can be pretty well hidden by these nice straight edges of the, of the paper. So that, that worked out great. About that time, I, I started moving this thing. Here I am porting it from the uh, original, oh, my cat's talking. I ported this thing from my uh, original prototype box into an actual box. But once again, this is cardboard. So I used the cardboard front panel to, to test fit and finish and ultimate control uh, ergonomics. And as you can see, I have volume and AGC vertically. Uh, on my final version, volume and AGC go across, high and low go across. Uh, this seemed intuitively good when I put it together. Uh, in use, I was constantly grabbing the wrong control, and I realized I made an intuitive error. But because I did this in cardboard, it was so easy to flip around. Uh, I changed a couple of the spacings on things in here as well. Uh, to get it to fit in the box. And so when I actually drilled the front panel, everything fit. And as you can see, because I went with a TFT touchscreen, all of these enunciators, all of these LEDs and half the buttons got to go away because now I can enunciate directly on the touchscreen and I had, can implement a menu system so that it's much easier to do things than having to have dedicated buttons. So for example, uh, right over here, you see I have my step size, which goes from one to 3,000, one to three kilohertz. And I realized after I bought a uh, transverter, it would be nice to have five kilohertz steps. So uh, I could add five kilohertz in software, put it on the screen, and I don't have to drill another hole and put another light in. So lights and buttons, can be replaced much more easily with a touch screen. And it, it, that wasn't intuitive to me, but boy, what, what a great thing that turned out to be. And here's the final layout. So this is, this is the same picture we saw before. This is the back of it. You see that I have a key outline, straight key line and paddles. This is the USB port, which it does not operate from the USB other than to load the firmware into it and to power it. Uh, I could have put a separate power button, but it was just much easier to power it through the USB port. And uh, this is the Ethernet connection where all the magic happens. And at some point in time in here, I decided that a Kier project, which is the same project I stole this uh, display from, uh, would be a good thing to have in here. So I ported over my, my Arduino Kier into this. And now it can either, it can key the flex or can operate as a standalone keyer 
and it'll key any modern rig. So Frank and Carrie, sorry guys, uh, no 807 cathode keying uh, for you guys with this. <laughs> and and uh, these, these are the CW memory buttons that I did, but, but this will key any other modern radio that, uh, that you can think of. Right, so how did it work? Well, here's field day 2021. Uh, here's my Flex 6400 sitting on the seat next to me. On top of that is a KPA 500 and a CAT 500 tuner. This little box is an AMC Ford uh, noise canceller, hugely important. All of the solar power and junk in the camper that makes noise, this band was unusable. This is 20, it was unusable. With this little gizmo, I can dial all that stuff out. I'm left with a couple little lines here of junk, but nothing that gets, got in the way. Uh, and then, of course, here is the laptop and the Teensy Maestro. Now, with this setup, you, you can't kind of tell right now. This is obviously before field day started. Look at all the empty space on 20, right? Uh, that isn't going to be that way when the contest starts. So. When I'm in casual operation, I find that mouse operation of the frequency, when I'm tuning around a band, I just find a signal, double click on it, find a strong one, double click on it. Whoops, I'm so sorry. Uh, double click on it, and you go right there. The, the mouse and keyboard in casual operation is fantastic. But when you get into um, contest operation, and this band is chock full of signals, and all you want to do is walk up the band three kilohertz at a time looking for your next contact. Then I use the uh, Teensy Maestro VFO button or knob to tune, and that lets me keep my mouse focused on the uh, logging program, which integrates seamlessly with the Flex, by the way. That was the easiest thing I ever did was get the AC log program to connect to the flex it just hooks right up. And then when I type in the call, I don't have to move around. I can just you know, type in and move, type in and move. And I'm not moving the mouse between screens. Uh, so I did have to run the generator to run this uh, KPA 500, but otherwise um, th this is a pretty efficient rig and I ran it completely off of solar charged batteries uh, when I was running 100 watts CW. Uh, and then just when I cranked up to 500 watts for sideband, by then I have, of course, I had to kick on the generator. But otherwise, it worked great. And just to finish up the uh, discussion on field day, so here's my fiberglass mast. I built a couple of uh, brackets on the back of my camper, and I just ran as a uh, inverted V. If I'm not running out in the open like I am in this picture, uh, when there's trees around, then I tend not to put the mast up and just uh, give myself a flat top about the size I can get them. And let's see. All right, let's talk a little bit about remote operation. I was hoping we were gonna be able to show this remotely from the airport. But I'll show it to you anyway, even though we're not operating remotely right now. Uh, Scott W0SJE uh, got a little hint of that uh, the other day. Uh, I was at his house and uh, showed him my flex setup and uh, remoted right in and it worked great. So what I have when I'm out camping at my home station is the flex, the KPA 500, the CAT 500 uh, PC that Mike Walker VA3MW uh, has a, a video on why you should really have a separate PC. You don't need it. It's nice to have. Boy, his, his recommendation was spot on. I have my T2X tail twister rotator connected in. So the, the amplifier and the tuner are connected to the computer through USB. The rotator is through USB but you notice there's no connection from the Flex 6400 to the computer. That goes straight to the modem and router, which the computer and the Flex are both in. So this is strictly a TCP IP connection. It has all kinds of advantages. And I'll show you one in just a second. At my camper, all I have 
is my laptop, the Teensy Maestro. This is not a giant line plug, by the way. This is a, a key, a set of key paddles, and my cell phone, and that's it. So on my, on my laptop in the camper, I run the VPN server, which I also run at home, and then I cascade the connection so that whatever's plugged in to my laptop acts like it's connected to the router at home. So then the Teensy Maestro, through this roundabout mechanism, finds the Flex 6400 and connects right to it. I also run SmartLink, I mean a Smart SDR over something called SmartLink. We won't get into SmartLink other than to say it brokers the connection through the internet and finds my radio for me, then my computer here is connected directly to my 6400 through a peer-to-peer -peer connection through the network. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of misconceptions that SmartLink is in the way of, of my communications. It's not. SmartLink only brokers the connection, and then I am just connected directly. So it's a great thing. I can run uh, the cat commands on both computers. So any device like uh, this a utility I have here that drives my amplifier talks to the thing through cat. And I can also run cat here in my camper so that the uh, uh, logging program can get the frequency and all the stuff that it needs through cat. And then I use team viewer to view my computer over here and rotate my rotator, uh, turn on and off the amplifier and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so the, the only thing that really limits me uh, is the fact that most places that I go don't have enough cell service to make this work. But if you have even moderate cell service, as long as the cell service itself has enough bandwidth, uh, you can make this all work. Flex has a mode called low bandwidth, and I do a low bandwidth connection and get away with murder <laughs> up in the mountains while I'm fishing uh, and, uh, and operate. Uh, I occasionally get on the Wednesday net through this uh, operation. I think you've heard me on there, Mike. So that, that's how that works. So any question on that? I know this is kind of a gloss over. Okay, so what am I gonna do next with this project? Well, I uh, built some functionality at Dave uh, W4WKU. Uh, you probably all knew him as KG0EW, Dave Patton. Uh, he wanted a PTT button uh, to make it easier to use his headset when he's in his hand van. So I said, well, yeah. So I coded that in for him and haven't implemented it on my own yet. So I'm gonna put that on there and put a jack on the back so that I can plug a foot switch in and then I'll have foot switch operation uh, when I'm in the camper. I'm going to put a side tone amplifier and low pass filter. Right now, my side tone is pretty low uh, in, um, in volume, and it's pretty buzzy because I only have one pin left. So instead of doing a proper ADC on it, it's just a, it's just a square wave. So that's kind of harsh. So I'm planning on doing something about that someday. Don't hold your breath. I need to replace some of the buttons, probably all the buttons in here. Uh, I bought very high quality encoders that have high quality buttons on them, but the rest of them, I couldn't find any good ones. So I bought the dime a dozen made out of Chinesium. Oh boy. So hopefully they'll all work fine when we're not doing the demo, but uh, they, they are a pain in the neck. So I will replace those. Uh, I do need to reprint the front panel uh, to, to take something that I've, I've changed since I built that. Uh, I need better corner panel screws. These are sticking up a little bit, so I got to fix that. Uh, I have an out of band thing that I'll show you, and I need to uh, account for transmit bandwidth when I do that. I haven't done that yet, so it's it's a it's a dumb one right now. You can actually transmit out of band uh, with with my thing, but when I fix that, you'll you'll at least be aware of it. And then uh, any software additions and tweaks as the mood strikes. Uh, if anybody ever builds one of these and wants something, let me know. Uh, if it's something that uh, I feel I can do, I'm happy to do it. And then if those jumpers and header pins cause problems, I'm going to solder them. All right, so let's look at some of the other teensy maestros that are out in the wild. So Dave, W4WKU, built the second one on the planet. 
Steve, AA3SS, built the set, a third. Ben from Hong Kong, VR2, VIY, built a couple now. He built one uh, prototype, much like I did. Then he built two more using a printed circuit board. And I've got pictures that's really phenomenal. Then Lasse from Sweden and Stan from uh, Maryland we're building them as of February this year. I talked to them and they were both slow, but working on them. They both had a, a front panel, a, a display working. So that was good. Mike, Mark and Jens also from Sweden. Uh, we're all working on them as of last year, but I haven't heard from them. So there might be for they These might be start and forget projects or maybe they're just slowly working on them. Kind of lost track. But anyway, those are the ones that I'm aware of. So here's Dave. Uh, I know many of us uh, operated this station when it was in uh, Winter Field Day. So here's a, here's a picture of it when I was operating it. You can tell it's me because Dave's left-handed. Here the mouse is over on the right side. Uh, and there's his teensy maestro in his handband. Here's a closer picture when he was operating it. You see the mouse over here on the left for him. He uh, built his and has said that these labels are temporary. Uh, I think they're temporary permanent myself, but uh, he, he claims he's going he's to do a better job with his labeling at some point. And there's his handband. That's uh, some idiot looking in his handband there. Uh, that was out at Roger's place, and uh, that's winter field day. So Jack was there, Mike, a few other of us uh, were out there, operated this, so it was kind of fun. And then Steve, so here's his, he, he went to Front Panel Express and had a custom front panel built for this out of uh, anodized aluminum. It's absolutely beautiful, but he made a mistake. If you look at the controls are over many of these beautiful custom color engraved uh, labels. So he put the labels too close to the buttons. Um, which is kind of unfortunate. Most of them are okay. You can read them okay, but several of them are covered up. Uh, he does not have the buttons across the top. And he told me it's because he's not a CW guy. And the way this is set up, you can leave off any control that you don't feel you're gonna use and it will work. So you don't have to have the screen, although with the menu system, you render much of this not so great. Uh, but if you, if you don't, want the B VFO, you can leave that off. Anything that you don't like, you can leave off. Here's Ben. Uh, this is his final version here. Uh, he also has some kind of custom uh, front panel that's absolutely beautiful. Uh, he put this in a bigger box than I did, so it takes up more real estate on the desk. But he, he also built this really nice uh, uh, printed circuit board and so here's the TC Maestro plugged in. Here is his uh, controller for the touch screen. Um, his, I don't, I think on the other side is where he plugs in the um, uh, pair of um, uh, multiplexers. I don't, I'm not sure where he has those, but I think they're on, on the other side of this. A nice bigger speaker than I have in mind and just a really nice layout, but, but he kept, he kept the layout the same, and he kept the general flavor and spirit of it uh, really the same. So he said he's building one for himself and one for another hand in Hong Kong that he's, that he's working, for, working with. All right, so if you want to build your own, if you have a flex or feel like getting one in the near future, uh, I've got a user manual, build materials, schematic, front panel layout, and then all of the software out on GitHub and then as previously mentioned, a really great thread on the Flex Forum um, that you can use. So the user manual, just give you a quick flavor of this. Are you tired of seeing this picture yet? Um, it shows you how to set things up, how to connect it, how to load the software, uh, what you can put on the, soft, on the uh, SD card and how that works, how all the controls work, uh, how the touch display works, what all the display elements are and how they work, how the menu operates, 
how the configuration file on the SD card works and what you can set and so forth. And at the end, uh, oh, I put a little blurb on remote operation. <clears throat> this is a placeholder, so uh, don't, don't go to my documentation looking for this part because it's not really done yet. And then finally, troubleshooting. So uh, some of the things that have happened uh, when other people built them, uh, I just added those to my troubleshooting things to uh, keep other people from having the same problems. So uh, anyway, I'm not going to go through all this, but all that's, all that's available. So any questions before we get into a quick demo here? All right, you guys are an easy crowd tonight. So here it is. Uh, this is the flex, and it, I just have a, a picture here of the maestro. This is live. Oh, hello. Um, so if you if you watch how the uh, interaction over the Ethernet is, uh, you'll see that it's really really fast. So as I as I turn the knob on the on the TNC maestro, you see that the that smart SDR keeps up. If I change Smart SDR, look how the Teensy Maestro keeps up. Okay, so the trick to this is uh, I did not uh, set this up. I can. I, I have a way to do that uh, through through a set of button pushes. I can set this up as what's called a GUI client, and that means that it has all the characteristics that the Smart SDR software has except for the um, displays. And, and it only has a limited set of buttons as well. So, uh, but, but nonetheless, when it's like this, I can, I can watch multiple frequencies at a time. I can even look at two different stations plugged into the TNC, uh, plugged into the Flex Radio at, at the same time with my TNC Maestro. So uh, Dan, when we talk about that, uh, I'll, I'll let you know what I did there uh, to make that work. It's really cool. And uh, thanks to Eric for uh, for setting me straight on, on how some of that worked. All right, uh, just a question, Len. All right, when you say you're, you're hearing two, or you're, you're hearing that in stereo, you're hearing both slices at the same time and different ears? I can, yeah. Okay. okay. But that's, that's, a, that's not a function of my box. That's a function of the flex radio. Right. Uh, yeah. So for your box and also remotely, what's the latency you get when you try CW? Can you do CW remote? I can. So here, let me just show you something here. I'll, I'll jump ahead to the menu system. So here's the menu. And let me, okay. All right. So here you see it says, oh, it says a KD0 RC big laptop, right? And that's the, that's the name of my my software on the uh, I mean that's the name of my station my, my PC and so that that's what we're looking at all right let me get to the question here uh, going through all the menus there's all my profiles uh, there's my miscellaneous all right on this miscellaneous menu if you look at Oh, I'm on the wrong menu. Uh, I apologize. I don't want to be Chinese buttons. See what I'm talking about? Here we go. Let me come back here to the keyer. All right. Um, right here on my keyer output, you see that it says local. I can set that to Ethernet. And so what that means is when I'm remote, I can key my radio. So it's not using that uh, keyer output on the back of the Teensy Maestro. It's actually sending flex keying commands to the radio. Now that's tricky because CW is a, is a real time thing. You can't listen to the side tone through the radio, uh, not even if you're using Wi Fi sometimes. Uh, so, depending on your latency, uh, I use the local side tone in the Teensy Maestro so that I hear my, my paddle uh, 
you know, activities and the sound are perfectly synchronized. Then I set a little bit of a delay <clears throat> on the flex radio and I'll get perfect CW every time. So I showed uh, Scott the other night, uh, the other day while I was demonstrating this from his house, I showed him how I can li listen to my own signal on my own radio while I'm remote. Uh, and I'm not gonna do that here tonight, but the flex radio has full duplex mode, which is just outrageously cool. And it lets you listen to your own signal. So I can dial in the amount of uh, delay that I need without putting much signal or any signal out over the air, but I can tell how much delay I need to make the signal work under the conditions that I'm under from a network perspective. Then everybody else hearing me, I may be delayed, say 100 milliseconds, say 200. What if it's outrageously bad and I'm at 350 milliseconds, right? That can happen on a bad network connection. This will still key it and, and be absolutely clean CW. Yeah, it sounds like the local side tone is, is one of the keys to making that work right for you. That that's great. And yeah, with the flex, that other feature, I mean you can actually you can actually dial in the delay. That's really neat. Yep. It, this is Jim yep. Cage. This is Jim Cage yeah. six HTV. I just proved that it to myself that this is a really live demo. There is my signal on 14.330. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just wanted to make sure it was really live. I like it. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> that was great. OK, so anyway, um, you know, all, all these controls, I, I won't go through all the controls, but they're, they're real time, right? But, one of the biggest things that I use is the old mute button, right? And and uh, if I want to listen to listen to Jim, I can I can do that. Uh, oh, there it comes. Uh, and I can I can dial up wherever I want to go. Uh, let me put that back on mute. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. Um, I, I guess that's kind of it. It's, it's um, really easy to use. It's really fun. It was a great fun project to build. And I'll say if anybody wants to build one, I'll be happy to help you in any way that I can. Um, the it, cost on this thing, uh, depending on what quality parts you put in it, can range anywhere from mm, high 200s, maybe 300 bucks, up to probably close to 400. Uh, if you leave some stuff off, you can you can start doing it pretty cheap. Uh, if you go wild with um, a really nice front panel from Front Panels or, uh, Express and do some things like that, you can you can add another hundred or two hundred to the cost of it just in the front panel. So uh, it, it's all about uh, what you like. You can leave it as a pile of knobs and buttons on the desk and do it pretty cheap. So if you want to do experiment like I did, uh, I literally just built it just to see if I could get it to connect to the radio. And when I was successful at that right away, well, the rest of it was a kind of a no-brainer. So I think that's about it. Anything anybody else wants to see or questions you might have? Uh, Ken, yeah. uh, I mean, Lynn, this is uh, Tom, W0IVJ. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, you ought to take out of your, your slide that you're not an engineer because this was a very, very professional job, including the documentation. And Thank uh, you. the other thing that I'd like to say is when you run out of pens, I'm always running out of pens on my Arduino projects. And I found one thing that's sort of useful and that's to put a, a, a string of resistors in series and then uh, hook the uh, output to, uh, the outputs to some of uh, the output to some, to a an um, analog channel, and then hook the buttons uh, where the yeah. string of resistors joined, and then by detecting what value of analog uh, signal you receive, you can use it as a switch. Yep. Yeah. That's I have done that on other projects, uh, but yeah. Thanks for that. Another thing that I can do 
uh, that I only recently discovered is that somebody has a library for multiplexing encoders. And so that's kind of cool too. So I, I will look at that at some point as well. Now, one thing of note, Tom, that, that you might be interested in, uh, the CW paddles are not used, don't use the multiplexer because I want them to be real time. And not only do I want them to be real time, I made them interrupt driven. So no matter where I am doing anything else, when, when that paddle hits, that's interrupt driven. And then to get a very well-timed CW signal, instead of just using loops to, to time things, um, I use uh, internal uh, Arduino timers to time the, the dot clock so that uh, no matter what's happening, uh, when I hit the paddle, it starts that dot clock. And then any other processing I have to do, I can just go ahead and do it at my leisure. And when that dot clock is up, when that 20 milliseconds is over, bang, it, it's, it stops it right now. So uh, past 100 words per minute, this thing has absolutely clean keying. I don't know if it's picosecond labs precision uh, keying, <laughs> but, but it's certainly microsecond uh, uh, kind of timing on that. So the CW is very precise on this one. So in your interrupt routine, then uh, when you hit the paddle, you go into your interrupt, you start the timer, get out of the interrupt, and then when the, the timer expires, you go back in? Back into its own interrupt that, that then stops the timer and start, depending on what's happened, uh, starts whatever the next timer is. Yep. Either a, either a dot, a space, or, or a... Uh, uh, and because during that time, I'm also setting the uh, uh, setting the CW on or off, and and sending the uh, if I'm in Ethernet mode, sending the keyer command through the Ethernet. Glenn, this was uh, fabulous, um, really really well done, and uh, the technical descriptions that you made of how things work are just right on. Um, you know, thanks for um, elevating. The usefulness of our community web uh, website. I'm glad that that worked out for you. But uh, um, I, I got to tell you, we uh, uh, I think it was last week when this kind of came to light to uh, the people here at Flex, and it made the rounds all the way up to the top. So um, everybody had a, a chance, and everybody you know said how cool it was, and I made a point to ask Mike if I could. Uh, uh, reach out to you, and this is uh, the way he uh, arranged that. So, um, thank you so much for a great presentation, great project, um, really, really well done. What a great, I mean, it, this is really what ham radio is about, right? When you do these kinds of projects, and so you are the epitome of, uh, of the amateur radio operator for sure. Uh, well, thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. That was just really, really well done, and. The other thing I won't say to the group, I got to jump off here, but um, I was born and raised in Colorado Springs and I took my um, uh, uh, well, novice in Colorado Springs, but took my um, uh, technician in general and advanced at the new customs house there in Denver. So um, you guys are in my old, uh, old stomping ground. So anyway, uh, it's great to see this and thank you so much for being such a, um, a great Flux customer. I really appreciate it. Well, great. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate the words. All right, Mike, back yeah, to any you, other, I guess. Uh, any other questions here or comments? Uh, that's an ambitious project, to say the least. Uh, and um, uh, I agree. I Do we, uh, you know, if I was a professor of engineering, I would, I would, Len, I would make sure you get an honorary engineering certificate of some kind uh, <laughs> at the school. Uh, and, uh, but uh, if they ever offer you something like that, beware, because they'll then come after you for a large contribution, see if they can yeah, do right. that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, be careful. But uh, anyway, that was, that was just if terrific. You're, if he's a real engineer, he'd still be building the project. He'd never get on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> putting the finger at, at some at somebody somebody else's fault as to why it isn't working that's yeah. possible 
But I, well, I must say, I'm very impressed. I was also impressed with the use of the cardboard idea. I think that's great. You know, you don't have to have everything look so slick and professional right away. And of course, a lot of people still use the old dead bug construction, you know, but and then just leave it at that way. Uh, well, that's kind of the ham spirit, you know, really. So, uh, but I'm glad to see you went the step further, as did the the other uh, builders, you know, uh, uh, of this thing. And I think it's probably you're probably going to have uh, many more uh, here uh, as this uh, video and other uh, things Flex does to publicize this uh, gets done. So, All right. this is uh, this is Will. Um, could could you explain? Um, I I haven't operated H. HF radios before, but I, I've seen this this AGC control. Could you explain a little bit more about what that does? Sure. So let's see. Uh, can you see my mouse moving around on here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you see this noise level that we have on the uh, on the uh, on the bottom of the pen adapter here. Uh, so here's the signal at fourteen three ninety, uh, and it's sticking up above the noise. And so what the AGC, do, AGC threshold does is it says, I'm going to amplify or attenuate any signals to keep them in kind of a range uh, that, that'll be pleasant to listen to. So if I have that, that threshold adjusted to maximum, it'll be down here somewhere well into the noise. That means this noise will be amplified by that little amplifier that's called the AGC threshold. When I'm up just above the noise, so I'm into the signal, but not into the noise, I can still hear the noise in the background, especially when the signal's not, not there, but only the signal will be amplified. Only things above my cursor here will be amplified by the AGC threshold. So if, if I have it up here, above where the signal is peaking, then it has no effect. I can turn it on or off, it doesn't matter. Once I'm down here, I'm starting to amplify the signal I want. And once I'm down here, I'm amplifying the signal plus the noise. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And the, the only thing I wish that the radio had was an, a visual indicator. So uh, right now you can see my AGC threshold is set at 33. And in fact, if you um, look here, you see that it's 33 on the screen. Oh, uh, made me lose my, there we go. Right, so if I, if I change it here, you can see it changing on the, on the thing. But anyway, that, that's what it does. That, that's the purpose for that. You can, can you all, I mean, with the flex software, you should be able to control the speed at which it, it reacts to, right? The changes in the signal. Can Correct. you do that so from there, the Teensy or, or does that need to be in the SDR? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't put that one in. Uh, you can see it's selected to medium uh, I, and you can set medium, uh, slow, fast or off. Uh, I, in all the time I've been using it, I haven't had a need to change it. So I didn't bother to, to put it into the Teensy Maestro. It would be an easy thing to code in. So if anybody built it and wanted a menu item to change that, well, I could put that in easily. Well, isn't it, I mean, the main reason, right, is the difference between CW and uh, SSB, isn't it? Uh, well, people that, wanna... In analog systems, that was pretty important. On, on the Flex, uh, I, I, I almost think they could have left it off. Hmm. Yeah. Do well, we Len, what, what you're describing uh, doesn't sound like classical AGC at all. It, it sounds like you're doing a, a, this is DSP somehow that you're doing a dynamic range expansion on that signal. And you're saying you're setting the threshold and you're saying you will selectively increase the level of anything that rises above that threshold Whereas AGC was always meant to prevent overload of a receiver, uh, you're doing something different with this. You're, you're setting a threshold. AGC can have a threshold, uh, but this is not classical AGC, it sounds like. It, it is not. That's correct. Uh, too bad Dan isn't still on. He could probably give a better description of this than I can. 
but um, it's a special it's a special function on the on the flex, I guess. Yeah, it it just brings some traditional controls in, into a, a new way of thinking about them. How many people here have flexes? Oh, a couple. Okay, uh, good. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have a uh, 6,500 uh, flex. Oh, which, great. Um, uh, I was thinking that this would uh, work with it just as well. I don't know the differences between the 64 and the 6,500. Yeah, the, it will work with the 6,500. I haven't tried it yet, but it will work with the 6,500 to work with any of the 6,000 series. Uh, you know, some of the primary differences between the 6,500 and the 6,400 are that the 6,400 have some, uh, uh, some additional filtering, I think that, oh no, I'm thinking of the 6,300. I'm not sure what the difference between the 65 and the 64 is. The 6300 is missing some of the contest filters. So it works great in, in casual operation at home, but when you're in a multi-transmitter environment, the 6300 doesn't work as well. I've had this 6400 out of the field day with uh, Dave, KG0EW at the time. Uh, we had our two antennas within 100, 150 yards of each other and operated on harmonically related bands without one single issue. And we even operated on the same band, one of us on CW, one of us on sideband with minimal uh, problems. So th these radios have, have really good um, harmonic attenuation in the transmitter and very good uh, uh, filters in the front end. Yeah, it's nice. You wouldn't have to add external bandpass filters and all this in an environment like that, like we usually do with conventional gear on field day. Yep. Well, the, the, the key there is to have um, low phase noise in the oscillator and low transmit um, composite noise. Exactly. And, and, that, and that's what this supposedly does. Now, some of the other new radios, the, uh, the new FTD X101, uh, the Kenwood and the ICOM 7610, uh, or the uh, Kenwood 890, I think they also uh, have some of these characteristics that the Flex has in terms of cleaner transmit. The Anon uh, has even cleaner transmit, supposedly with their pure signal uh, business. Yeah, but, that's what uh, I'm running is as an Anon 7000 DLE. Yeah, there you go. And so that, that I think, has a, a yet another set of technology that makes it even cleaner than the, than the flex on transmit. Hmm. Uh, anything else, you know, uh, that might be, a, a, we may try to, uh, the guy who uh, devised the clear signal is in Colorado, isn't he, Tom? I think so. Yeah, Warren Pratt, he's in uh, Fort Collins. Yeah, so we oh. may try and have him do a future uh, meeting, one of these uh, presentations as well. On, on that interesting uh, innovation there, It'll probably become more common. I assume he's willing to license that to, uh, you know, uh, some of the other manuf some, some manufacturers at some point. Well, it's, be it's, it's open source right now. And anytime you do open source, if you use their software, then you've got to be open source yourself. And uh, I don't think any of the conventional manufacturers no. are willing to do that. All right. No, Flex did that originally, got burned, and they're not going there again, I'm pretty sure. Now, you asked if there were any Flex users, and I didn't raise my hand, but I had, I, I've, I used an SDR-1000 for years. Oh, great. Yeah, I haven't tried that one. The, the 1000 and the 1500, the 3000, the 5000, um, all, all very cool radios. Yeah, but they would they would not work because they do not have Ethernet. Right. Right. Well, yeah, and they don't have the API that this does. Right. Yeah. Right, I'm well, actually think... running. Oh. Go ahead, Randy. I was gonna say I'm actually running a Sun SDR2 Pro 
uh, oh. SDR rig uh, right now. Um, picked it up a little, a little over a month ago, and I'm really enjoying it. That's cool. Yeah, those are those are cool too. I haven't actually run one, but uh, specs are pretty impressive on those as well. Yeah, and uh, I'm. It also has a built-in uh, two-meter all-mode uh, transverter. So. Uh, uh, since the pandemic started, I've been dabbling in two, uh, weak signal two meter stuff. And, uh, so it's nice. It, it, it drives, uh, well, it puts out about eight Watts on two meters and then it drives a 200 Watt, uh, amp I have, um, and a beam. And I've been having a lot of fun with the beam spinners in the mornings and, um, it does great on HF. Uh, and it's probably one of the most pleasant radios I've ever had the pleasure of listening to. Uh, it's right there with my KX3 as far as like listener fatigue. I don't oh, know what right. it is. You know, certain certain radios just it's really hard to listen to just, you know, if you're listening to static or whatever, you know, contesting or whatever. Um, but the KX3 is really pleasant to my ear. And so is the uh, Sun. Um, sounds great. Um, and uh, I've, I've owned a 6300. I've owned a 3000. Um, and so I've dabbled in SDR for years, but I'm, I'm really liking this one. Um, That's good. Uh, the software is nice and solid. They're, they're developing a, a version three of the software. It's an alpha version right now. So it's a little bleeding edge and things may not work or be stable, but um, it's pretty interesting. It's all, a, it's a Russian company, um, but they've got a solid uh, business plan and, and the software is good so far. And uh, it uses um, virtual audio cables, uh, just like, uh, you know, the new uh, uh, Power SDR does, or yeah, Power SDR. I always get Power and Smart mixed up. I don't know on my mind. Yeah. But, so, um, uh, yeah, on, these it's, on the newer ones, it's the Smart SDR. Yeah. Uh, and it runs uh, on the Mac. They're developing the software uh, on Metal. So it runs on Mac. You can run the same exact um, feature for feature across uh, any platform uh, on Mac OS, on Linux, and on Windows. And oh, wow. you, you, don't, you don't sacrifice. It's like, oh, I, I've got more features because I use Windows because they develop more for that. They're developing on a, on a platform in a, in a language called Metal. And so all they have to do is just compile it for the platform. And it, it's really quite brilliant. Wow, very good. Uh, any other comments or questions? If not, I, I, I'm not going to close the meeting. Our custom has been to just leave this open so that people can informally chat. And uh, we will do that probably till, you know, close to nine o'clock if anyone wants to hang around. Uh, and I will do that. But right now we want to thank Len for his great presentation and uh, show what, what happens when we all clap together here over this uh, Simplex channel, as we can see here. Yes, seeing a lot of hands there. Thank you. Everybody's clapping. Yes. So thanks again, Len, for all of this. And uh, and uh, I just wish we could get Dave back here to operate on uh, Winter Field Day again. That was a that was a that was a lot of fun. That was a blast. Yep. Well, maybe it'll be me this year doing it. Yeah. Well, you uh, you you said well, you say you go camping and fishing. You're converting that as a you pretty much have the same functionality that Dave had. Except for the, yeah. uh, except for the uh, hydraulic mast. Uh, yeah, my, my, my mast only raises manually and I don't have any kind of rotator or, or beam. So with, with Dave uh, raising it up and having a wire antenna for the low bands and a hex beam for the higher bands, uh, he, he's got a killer station now when he's remote. Worked very well. All right. Well, very good. So uh, thanks everybody today. And uh, any other club business by any chance people thought of during the meeting? Not that we ever have much club business, but uh, oh, Will, yes, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Um, this is Will, KF0FEC. Um, I can give you a little report out on what I've learned about that, that crosstalk that we're hearing on the, on the two meter repeater. Yeah, let me just hold on a sec. So let me just fill people in. So we just, we had some interference on our, our two meter repeater, which, you know, may be happening more routinely, but never gets reported because nobody notices it. But uh, this was during one of our 